Shabbat Shalom and Hag Sukkot Sameach friends. It is so good to be with you once again for another holy time on God's calendar. I pray that you're very excited about this special season that is called the season of rejoicing or the season of our joy. Sukkot goes by a number of different names. Some of them we will be discussing in our teaching today. But one thing that we do know is that it is the season of rejoicing and this is a command. It's actually a command from Hashem to rejoice during this time. So Sukkot is for seven days, but we also have an additional day. Although it's a distinct holiday or holy day, it is usually just joined on to Sukkot. So it's an eight day long, sometimes nine days of rejoicing and celebrating and so on. And like I said, it's a biblical command. Now we have to be very deliberate and purposeful in rejoicing. After we've gone through Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, by the time we get to the last couple of days during Sukkot, we begin to wind down. You know, we get tired and so on and so forth. But we have to remember that it is a command to rejoice. And I'm reminded of something that we read in the book of Nehemiah. So when the Jewish people returned from Babylonian exile, there were people in the midst who did not know the Hebrew language anymore. The language was lost while they were in exile. And they didn't know the Torah. They didn't know the laws of Hashem. And so, on the first day of the seventh month, which would be Rosh Hashanah, the scriptures tell us that Ezra brought out the scroll and he built a bima, a platform that he stood on and read from the Torah and he began to explain what the Torah was saying in a way that the people could understand. And the scriptures tell us that when they realized that they were not living by the laws of Torah and they had lost so much due to exile, they began to weep. The weeping was so loud. And Nehemiah said to them, do not weep, stop your weeping. This is a holy day of the Lord and this is a day of rejoicing. Remember on the first of Tishrei, we are commanded to sound the shofar. It's a day to make noise. It's a day to rejoice in Hashem. So he said, you can't weep. He said, go home and eat food and sweet drinks and enjoy yourselves and rejoice in the Lord because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so I am sharing the story with you to say that there are things that will come our way right? Every day there are things that come our way to try to steal our joy. But during this time of Sukkot, we have to remember it's a command for us to rejoice. When we get to the last couple of days of Sukkot and we feel as if we're dragging, we have to speak to ourselves and encourage ourselves and remind ourselves that it is a season to rejoice. We cannot be sad and drained and tired in this season. And we are reminded that the joy of Hashem is our strength. Amen. So with that said, let us go into our discussion for today. We have a subtitled this teaching, The Mystery of the Sukha, the Lulav, and the Etrog. But I really am going to zero in on the Lulav. So let's talk a little bit about the mystery of the Sukkah. There is the physical component of the Sukkah. It's a, it's a physical tent, right? But because the Torah has 70 faces, the same Sukkah can be a metaphor for the human body because the human body houses the soul. So it's used as a metaphor for the human body. It's also used as a metaphor for the earth. It's also used as a metaphor for the physical aspect of the messianic 
rule or kingdom to come in the future. And there are many other things that the Sukha represents. When we get to chapter 23 of Leviticus, and we are looking at the command, we will see where Hashem gave specifications for the Sukkah, and we will discuss that a little bit further down. Now, let's talk a little bit about the Atrog. The Atrog or the citron fruit was really not something that we see stated explicitly in scripture. I think that that was added later on as, you know, Judaism expanded and grew and people were in different places and so on and so forth the citron was added however it does have a spiritual meaning and of course again there are many different meanings but one of the things that i love about the citron is the smell of it the smell of it because we know that in scripture smell is very important to Hashem. Fragrance is very important to Hashem. Because even when the temple and the tabernacle stood, the temples, first and second temples and the tabernacle stood, as part of Israel's offerings to Hashem, there were times when frankincense had to be offered with certain food offerings and, you know, the priest had to burn incense and all of that stuff. And we know that Hashem talks about the sacrifices coming up to him as a sweet smelling aroma and all of those things. So we know that fragrance is very important to Hashem. So the etrog represents fragrance. That's just one thing that it represents, fragrance. And when we get further down into our discussion, it will begin to become a little clearer for you. Like I said, we're going to be focusing on the lulav today because I think what Hashem has placed on my heart and what the Ruach HaKodesh is teaching us today is just going to be a blessing to you. So with that said, let us go to the biblical command for the celebration of Sukkot. And by the way, Sukkot is plural and it means booths or tents. Sukkah is singular, meaning tent or booth. So let's read from verse 39 through to 43 of Leviticus chapter 23 or Vayikra chapter 23. So it says, so beginning with the 15th day of the seventh month, after you have gathered the crops of the land, celebrate the festival to the Lord for seven days. The first day is a day of Sabbath rest, and the eighth day, Shemini Atzeret, is also a day of Sabbath rest. Let's read verse 40. On the first day, you are to take branches from luxuriant trees, from palms, willows, and other leafy trees, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So it's a command. We are to rejoice before Hashem and we are to take palms, willows, and other leafy trees. So these uh, palms and trees that the people would carry, they were supposed to wave them. Not like how we wave in the Western world, right? There was a specific way that uh, these uh, Palms were supposed to be waved. As a matter of fact, in scripture, the uh, priests would wave in, in, in a different direction than this way, right? So there would be this way, this way, this way, this way, right? So, right. So today, even with the waving of the lulav, it's done some in some communities in four directions. In some communities, they do it in six different directions. But the command was to take luxuriant trees from palms, willows, and other leafy trees and rejoice before the Lord for seven days. Verse 41 says, celebrate this as a festival to the Lord for seven days each year. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Celebrate it in the seventh month. Live in temporary shelters for seven days. So here we have a specification for the sukkah. The sukkah couldn't be a permanent structure. It had to be temporary. And this is one of the reasons why the sukkah represents like the human 
body, the physical body, because the physical body is a temporary shelter for the spiritual or for the spirit man, for the soul, right? So it is supposed to be flimsy, but not flimsy where it can be blown down, but it was not supposed to be temp it was not supposed to be permanent. So here's a reason why Hashem says this is a command to build sukkah. He said all native born Israelites are to live in such shelters. So your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in temporary shelters when I brought them out of Egypt. So, so the sukkah or Sukkot is supposed to also be a reminder to us that Hashem took us out of Egypt. All the holy days are a reminder to us of our deliverance out of Egypt. That he took us out of Egypt, but he also allowed the ancestors to live in temporary shelters, meaning that they lived in temporary shelters, but he was a shelter for them in that he protected them. So even though the shelters were flimsy, Israel was able to survive because Hashem was the shelter over his people. So this is where we find the commandment for Sukkot. Now Sukkot also goes by other names as well. It is known as the Feast of Tabernacles. It also represents Hashem tabernacling with his people or living with his people. You know, it's amazing that just as Israel lived in tents, Hashem lived in tent. He lived in a tent among his people. He lived in the tabernacle, right? So it's also known as the Feast of Tabernacles when God tabernacles with his people. It is also known as the Feast of Ingathering because Israel would be harvesting the rest of their crops and fruits. This signifies the end of the harvest season in the land of Israel. So it's called the season of ingathering. The farmer is bringing in all of his, his uh, crops, the rest of his crops, right? It's also the time when fruits would be harvested. So we know in the springtime, we're looking at uh, grains. We're looking first at barley, then we're looking at wheat and so on. And there would be still a little leftover of those things, but the harvest in the autumn is usually for fruits. So it's called the Feast of Ingathering. And it's also called the season of our rejoicing because Hashem commanded us to rejoice before him. Now, why was there a commandment to take leafy trees? Why? Like I said before, it was a way to wave and to rejoice before Hashem. So it symbolized rejoicing. But there is more that this symbolized and we would have to search for it in the Torah. Let's talk a little bit about the lulav. So what is the lulav? In Hebrew, the word lulav means a closed frond of the date palm tree. But there were other leafy trees that were supposed to be added to that also, including the willows. It tied together into a bouquet and those are shaken. That's what the lulav is. It's a bouquet of different species. Now, if we are going to have a better understanding of what the lulav represents, we're going to have to go back to God's covenant with Abraham Avinu. We have to go back to the covenant with Abraham Avinu. Why? Here's, here's why we have to go back to the covenant with Abraham. Because... In Leviticus chapter 23, Hashem says, this is to be a lasting ordinance for all the generations and all native born Israelites are to live in such shelters. So your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in temporary shelters when I brought them up out of Egypt. So if we're to understand Sukkot, and if we're to understand the meaning of the lulav, we're going to have to go back to the beginning of all native born Israelites. And that is Abraham.
okay? So I want us now to go to the book of Breshit. We're going to look at Breshit chapter 17, Genesis chapter 17. We're going to read from verse 4 down to verse 8. Hashem is reiterating his covenant with Avram Avinu here. This is what he says. As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. We know that when Abraham was called, he wasn't called Abraham. When he was first called by God, his name was Abram, which means exalted father. His name was expanded to Abraham. So it's no longer Abram, but Abraham. So there was an extension of his name. The rabbis tell us that the He was put in, put in his name, right? The He, H, was put in his name, and it's actually a part of the four-letter name of Hashem, yud He vav He. So he added that He in Abraham's name. It's as if he breathed life into Abraham's name and expanded and extended Abraham's name. What does the name Abraham mean? Father of a multitude of nations. So he wasn't just an exalted father. He was now going to be father of many nations. So it says in verse 5, no longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham or Avraham. For I have made you the father of many nations. Verse 6, I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations out of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. So in every generation, Hashem is fulfilling his covenant to Abraham. So it says, the whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession, as a who? Everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. So let's talk a little bit about this. Hashem says, I'm going to make you the father of a multitude of nations. So the sukkah and also the rest of the commandments for the festival, the lulav and rejoicing in Hashem has to do with the the covenant or the promise that Hashem made to Abraham. And it has to do with him saying, I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. Now, how was God going to make nations come from Abraham? Well, we're talking about the nations coming from Abraham. I want you to understand that we know that Abraham had other sons, right? Abraham had other sons. He had Ishmael, and we know that the Arab nation comes from Ishmael. We already know that. We know also that Abraham had other sons with his wife after Sarah died, Keturah. A lot of times we don't remember Keturah, but Abraham had other sons with her. Her sons also became nations. One of his descendants is the Midianites, right? Because Keturah had a son for Abraham called Midian, and there were other nations as well. We're not talking about those nations, right? They are of Abraham, but remember what Hashem said to Abraham when he was told to listen to Sarah and send Hagar away. By sending Hagar away, it was a legal act under the Hammurabi Code that meant that it was through Isaac that God's promises would be fulfilled and recognized, okay? So we're talking about not only a legal act of sending her away but and sending her Hagar and her son away, but it was also a spiritual act because Hashem says, even though I will make Ishmael great because he's your son, understand that the covenant and everything concerning the covenant, the promises and everything would be through Yitzhak. It's important for us to understand that. So when we talk about nations, we know that there are other nations from Abraham. 
However, we are talking about his descendants through Isaac because we are doing this in keeping with Hashem's covenant promises. Okay, so how was God going to make nations come from Abraham? It was going to be through Isaac. Isaac would have sons and one of Isaac's sons, Jacob, also known as Israel, would be how nations would come from Abraham. Now we know that Abraham would also have spiritual descendants, right? We know that because the Brit Hadashah teaches us that. We read in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 3 from verse 7, it says, understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So we know that Abraham would also have spiritual descendants. In the book of Galatians, we're told that those who would come to faith in the God of Israel and his Moshiach would be called the sons of Abraham by faith. What I need you to understand in this teaching today, though, is we are talking about physical nations. So we know that he would become the father of many nations spiritually. But a lot of people miss this point that Abraham would also become the father of many nations physically. And I want us to focus on the physical descendants of Abraham for a moment. How would Abraham become the father of a multitude of nations physically? When we go to Breshit 48, 16 and 19, we see where Jacob on his deathbed is blessing his sons. And as part of blessing his sons, he said to Joseph, I am going to adopt your sons. Your sons will be my sons. They will bear my name. And I want you to understand this. They weren't spiritual Israel. They were physical Israel. Why? Because Joseph was Jacob's physical sons. So these two sons are physical sons. And this is what Jacob spoke over those boys. He said, May they be called by my name, so they would be called Israel. And the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, they would be known as the descendants of Abraham and Isaac. Not only that, when he said, may they be called by my name, it's also alluding to the covenant promises that God made. Because remember, a name is more than just a, a way to identify a person. A name has to do with an individual's destiny. So the fact that they would bear uh, Jacob's name, Abraham's name, and Isaac's name, it meant that these two boys would also share in the covenant promises or the destiny of their forefathers. He goes on to say, and may they increase greatly on the earth. Then it goes on to say in, in verse 19, his younger brother, meaning Ephraim, will be greater than he, meaning Manasseh. And his descendants will become a multitude of nations. I want you to understand this. His descendants will become a multitude of nations. Jacob said, Manasseh, which is the firstborn, will be great. He will become a nation. So Manasseh would become a nation. But he said, Ephraim would become a multitude of nations. Now, in the Hebrew, this term, multitude of nations, is Melahagoim. Melahagoim. Now, the word Mela means fullness, and Ha in Hebrew means the, right? 
and goyim means nations. So Melah goyim means that Ephraim would be the fullness of the nations. What does this mean? Fullness means to fill up. So Ephraim would fill up. So for Ephraim to fill up, there had to be something that needed filling up. What needed filling up? What needed filling up was the world, God's world. That's what needed filling up. So you would ask, but well, wasn't the world filled up before that? And the answer is no. The world wasn't filled up before that. I shared with you before that according to the rabbis, after the flood, there were 70 nations that came from Noah's sons. Those nations, however, were all concentrated in a particular place on earth. Now, I would like for us to take a look at uh, these maps that I'm about to share with you. I, I know that some of you are like me, we're all visual people and we learn better when we're able to see. So I'm gonna share here with you these images and I pray that it will open your eyes to understand a little bit clearer what I'm sharing with you. So the first one that I want us to look at is this globe here. So, I want us to concentrate um, on the top. Here we have the Western Hemisphere and we also have the Eastern Hemisphere. And I'm not going to get too deep into this. I just want you to have the visuals, okay? So here we have the Eastern Hemisphere. If we were to look at the Eastern Hemisphere, where we see over here, we see Europe, we see Asia, we see Africa over in this part here. Between Africa and Asia, this highlighted portion right in the middle here is where we have the Middle East. I'm going to show you another image that it is going to become clearer to you. What I want you to understand is that this area right here is what is called the old world. When we read scripture, we're going to find that civilization was centered round about this particular area here. And as Israel began to move or to be dispersed into the diaspora, we had people leaving the land of Israel and moving into other areas, right? So we had people going into Africa, people going into Asia, people going into, you know, other parts of the world, but everything was concentrated in this particular area here that we're looking at known as the East. Then there was a whole nother area known as the Western Hemisphere, that at the time of the Bible, nobody knew about that area. As a matter of fact, they all believed that the world was where they lived and what they knew. This is why it's called the Old World. And geographically, you can go and do some research as to the various countries that make up the Old World. Israel being part of that, you can go and do some research on, uh, um, on your own. Now, let us take a look at the other image. Now, this makes it clearer because now you can see properly, you can see the Middle East, you can see parts of Africa and Asia and Europe and all of those different places, right? Now, like I said before, during Bible times, the places that are mentioned in the Bible were places in the Middle East and the surrounding areas. And this was the world for the people there. It would be later on in human history that they would discover what is known as the New World. And the New World had to do with the Western Hemisphere. 
It had to do with areas such as North and South and Central America and the Caribbean and so on and so forth. The people of the Bible didn't know that those places existed because civilization was centered in the East. So now that we see this, it will give us greater understanding into when I say to you that the world wasn't filled up. When that prophecy was spoken, the world wasn't filled up. But God was going to use Ephraim, Ephraim, to fill up the world. I want us now to turn our attention to the book of Amos, Amos chapter 9. We're going to look at verse 10 through to 12. This is what it says. In that day, I will restore David's fallen shelter. Another name for shelter here is tent or sukkah. And I shared with you that it really means David's fallen dynasty. And it says here, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and will rebuild it as it used to be. So that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name declares the Lord, who will do these things. And now how were the nations going to bear Hashem's name? What does that mean, all the nations that bear my name? Israel is God's nation. We talk about chosenness. Israel is chosen by God, but chosen to do what? Israel was chosen by God to do a particular task. And we know that yes, we say Israel was chosen to be the light of the world. Israel is chosen to be salt. Israel is chosen to be all of these different things. But Israel was also chosen by God so that the nations could be blessed. Also, that God would have nations. God chose one nation through whom he would make many nations for himself. I need you to get this. God chose one nation through whom he would make many nations for himself. He would make many nations spiritually. Those who come to faith are coming to him spiritually from the nations. But he would also make physical nations for himself. You know, a lot of times people who are not ethnically Israel or they don't think that they're ethnically Israel sometimes feel a little left out or feel like an afterthought, right? So what about the other nations? Are you saying that Hashem's interest is only Israel? And I remember having this conversation with one of a dear sweet friend of mine and trying to explain that, no, the nations of the world are not afterthoughts. But Hashem had to choose one so that he could carry out his purpose. So he says... There are nations out there who bear my name. How did the nations bear God's name? Just like they bore the names Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob said, Ephraim and Manasseh will bear my name. They will bear Abraham's name. They will bear Isaac's name. God says the nations that bear my name. What does it mean? It means that they are part of God's covenant people. Different nations are part of God's covenant people. How so? As Ephraim would be scattered to fill up the nations of the world, right? People groups from these various nations would actually have Israelite blood flowing through their veins. They would be physical descendants of Abraham. And I know that because of what a lot of us have been taught. We believe that this is purely spiritual when we talk about the children of Abraham. We're talking about Israel as a physical um, 
ch uh, child or nation connected to Abraham, but everybody else is really spiritual, not so. There is a spiritual, but I want you to understand the physical. There are physical descendants of Abraham in the nations of the world through Ephraim. And when we read about, when we read in scripture about a multitude of nations, we think primarily of non-Israelites. A multitude of nations, yes, there are non-Israelites there too, but a multitude of nations also include Israelites. I remember one night, as I was sweeping, I heard a voice say to me, the mystery is Ephraim is the fullness of the nations. That's what he said. The mystery is, this is the mystery. The mystery is Ephraim is the fullness of the nations. Now, a lot of people, when we talk about the fullness of the nations, like I said before, is really thinking along the lines of non-Israelites. What the Holy Spirit was saying to me that night is that when we talk about the fullness of the nations in the Bible, in the Tanakh, and also in the Brit Hadashah, we are not talking about non-Israelites necessarily. We're talking about Israelites who live in the nations and who even think that they are going, who think that they are non-Israelites, who think that they are Gentiles, but they are not. He said, this is a mystery. Ephraim is the fullness of the nations. Ephraim is who I will use to fill up the nations, to fill up the nations. Now, with that said, I would like for us to go to the book of Romans. We're going to look at Romans chapter 11. So the cultivated olive tree represents Israel. Israel. He even goes on to talk about the root. And he says, you know, the covenant and, and covenant and Abraham and the promises and the Torah and all of these different things are at the root. But the olive tree, the cultivated olive tree is actually Israel. He said some of those branches have been broken off. Why were they broken off? They were broken off because of disobedience. Just as Ephraim was broken off and banished because of disobedience, right? Then he says, and this is a part that I want you to zero in on. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. What did I tell you I heard in my dream? The mystery. This is the mystery. The mystery. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Huh. Israel has experienced a partial hardening until the fullness of the Gentiles. The fullness. The Melahagoyim, the fullness of the Gentiles. So the mystery is that Ephraim would fill up the Gentile world. It doesn't mean that they are Gentiles, they live like Gentiles, but it doesn't mean that they are Gentiles, but they would fill up the Gentile world. It says, but Israel's hardening is until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And he said, in this way, all Israel will be saved. What do you mean all Israel will be saved? Those who had left, those who have been scattered, those who would come and join Israel by faith, all Israel would be saved. He said, this is a mystery. This is a mystery. Ephraim is the fullness of the Gentiles. So right now, Ephraim is in the Gentile world, filling up the nations. But when the assignment is complete, 
when the assignment is complete. And Hashem has people, Israel, physical descendants of Abraham, in every nation. It would be the fullness of the Gentile world, the fullness of the nations. Ephraim would have completed his task of filling up the Gentile world. Now, with all of that said, I want us to go to the lulav because this is a discussion about the lulav. So Hashem says you are to take different trees and you are to bring them all together and you're going to make them one and you're going to wave them and you're going to rejoice. Why? Because the lulav is a picture of the nations gathered, the nations coming together. And this is also why it is shaken in different directions because it's speaking about Hashem gathering from the nations, the four corners of the earth. It's a picture of the nations gathered and Israel being restored with many different nations as a per the promise to Abraham in a physical sense. But there is also the spiritual component as well. I want to also say this. Thank you, Holy Spirit. When we talk about Gentiles in scripture, we're talking about goyim, right? Meaning that they're from the nations, meaning that they're not from Israel. They're from the nations of the world. A lot of times when we hear the nations of the world, we just automatically think it has nothing to do with Israel. Goyim or Gentiles can include Israel. And here's what I'm saying. Not everybody who is Israel live in the land of Israel and even know that they are physically Israel and even identify with Israel. So technically speaking, when the Bible talks about the bringing in of the Gentiles, it, just, it does not mean only non-Israel. Israelites are coming in too. And because they are Melahagoyim, they are a multitude of nations, part of the Gentile world. It's just that they are Israel by blood. And this is why there is this awakening that is happening. And I believe that in every generation, there is an awakening that takes place. Hashem speaks to generations. Hashem speaks to peoples in the, ge the generations before and the generations after us. Until the time comes for the Messiah to come, people will be returning to covenant and returning to the Torah. But I tell you that in this season, Hashem has been speaking to me so much about Ephraim. Friends, Ephraim is coming home. The Sukkah speaks to God tabernacling with his people. The Sukkah speaks to the tabernacle. And so as we are in this time of Sukkot, we need to remember that when the Messiah comes, there is going to be the physical Sukkah, right? The physical kingdom upon the earth. 
the physical tabernacle. Hashem will be physically tabernacling with us. But now there is a spiritual tabernacling that is taking place. And Hashem said on the first day of Sukkot, you are to bring your trees and you are to wave them before me and you are to rejoice. Why should we rejoice? Because the lulav signifies God's people, the nations who bear his name coming from the east, the west, the north, the south. There is no nation on this earth where you cannot find Israelites in there. And this, Hashem says, is a mystery. But Baruch Hashem, he is revealing this mystery to those who have a heart for truth. And so Hashem is gathering his people to live under his sukkah. As a matter of fact, the rabbis say that when we look at the wording on a soul level, on a spiritual level, what it's saying is that Israel would live in sukkah. What does this mean? It means that all of Israel would live under one sukkah. So right now, different people are building up their different Sukkot, their different tents. But Hashem's desire, right, is for all Israel to live under one Sukkah. And this is what the Lulav represents. All the nations coming together, living under Hashem's one Sukkah. Now, in this time of Sukkot, I want to make a declaration. And the declaration that I am making in this time of Sukkot, Sukkot is seven days, but there is an eighth day attached. And we know that eight is the number of rebirth. And eight is the number of new beginnings. And I declare in this time of Sukkot, over this eight day period, we're going to be seeing Ephraim, peoples leaving from wherever they're at. I see Ephraim coming. And I just feel the Ruach HaKodesh over these words right now. I see Ephraim coming. In this time of Sukkot, Ephraim is coming. From the east, the west, the north, the south, they are coming under Hashem's sukkah. Hashem is spreading his sukkah. He is extending his sukkah. He is spreading his sukkah out. And people are coming in. They are coming in. They are coming in. And not only do we have physical Israel coming in, peoples, other peoples who are not Israel, are also coming with them. There is a mighty move of Hashem in the earth during these eight days. There is a mighty move of Hashem. People are going to begin to see and to understand the truth, to understand who they are, to understand the importance of Torah, to understand who Yeshua Messiah is. They're going to begin to get revelation. There are people who are going to begin to have dreams and visions during these eight days. And they are going to come under God's sukkah. This is a season of rejoicing. You're going to be rejoicing because your eyes are about to open and you're about to be set free. The word on Rosh Hashanah was you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You're about to be set free. So there is going to be a time of rejoicing. 
There's some of you, as you hear this word, there is going to be fire breaking out in your belly. There is going to be a move of the rock, a Kodesh, in your spirit. And you're going to know. Because the word of God says that the spirit of Hashem bears witness with our spirit that we are children of Hashem. The spirit is right now bearing witness with your spirit. Some of you are going to be, it's going to be revealed to you which tribe you're from. Some of you, you are from Ephraim. You know this, you are Israel. You have Israelite blood running through your veins the sukkah of Hashem is open you see the sukkah behind me this is what the sukkah is the sukkah was not supposed to be enclosed the sukkah was supposed to be open so that people could come in right you see the sukkah just as the sukkah is open so it is that God's sukkah is open right it is open and the sukkah was supposed to have leaves on top. You know why? So that we could look through the sukkah and see the stars. You know why? Because God's covenant with Abraham was, I will make your, descend your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. So when we're in the sukkah, we're supposed to be able to look up and we're supposed to be able to remember the covenant. Oh my goodness, this is a time of covenant, renewal, covenant, restoration. Ephraim is coming. Hashem Sukkah is open. This is the year of the door. The door is open. The Sukkah doesn't have a door. But some people, you know, because they want a little privacy, will put up a curtain there. No, the Sukkah does not have a curtain. The Sukkah doesn't have a door. It is open and Hashem is calling. I want you to know that if you believe that this word is for you today and Hashem is speaking to you, I have been issuing this call for weeks now. The email address is on your screen. It's also in the description box below. I am inviting you to reach out to us as a ministry and ask us whatever questions you may have about Ephraim, about the Torah, about Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, about the God of Israel, about whatever it is that you want to ask. Hashem is moving in this time. So, this gives us even more reason to rejoice if you're excited about the move of God in the lives of his people. I want to thank you so much for having joined us on this first day of Sukkot. I know that you are aware by now that we have a number of different things lined up on this channel throughout this period of time. So, I want to encourage you to read the Torah portions that we will post each day for the Kol Hamwed or the intermediate days of Sukkot. And I also want to encourage you to spend time with Hashem, hear what He is saying and do what He says that you are to do. Talking about doing what He says that you are to do, I want to remind you that this is a Shabbat and we have a biblical obligation on a Shabbat to bring a special offering before Hashem when we come before him. It is also a biblical command for us to bring a special offering to Hashem on a feast day. Every feast day, Israel had to bring a special offering. There were special offerings associated with feast days. I want to encourage you to bring a special offering for the for Sukkot. As a matter of fact, the, co the, the commandment concerning Sukkot is that every day for the seven days, the people were supposed to bring an offering every day. I know that for some persons, you just want to do a one-time thing. For some persons, maybe you feel led to do it daily. Whatever it is, I just want to encourage you, please. Do not treat Hashem with scant regard. Do not treat his Torah with scant regard. He says, when you come, bring a special offering on the feast days. Do you know that every single feast day, this is something that uh, Apostle Ori and I do. As a matter of fact, we don't do what we, we, we don't tell you to do what we don't do. Every feast day, every Rosh Chodesh, every Shabbat, tithes, offering, tzedakah, anything that you can think of. We are not just telling you to bring these things to Hashem, we bring them to. 
There are times when we may just want to give a thanksgiving offering to Hashem because he has done something amazing and we just want to give thanks. There are times when we will bring an elevation offering before Hashem because we feel the need to bring an offering for elevation. There are times when we just bring a free will offering. And so I tell you this, friends, don't think that I'm trying to get money out of you. No, I'm trying to get you to obey God's commandments. That's what I'm trying to do. I want you to join us and obey Hashem together. So with that said, I pray that you have a wonderful rest of the Shabbat. And until we meet again, may Hashem continue to bless you and your household with peace. Until we meet again, Shalom, Shalom, and Kol Tov. Thank you.